lovelies, welcome to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. I release content on a Wednesday and Sunday that is crime related, so if you've just stumbled across this channel and aren't one of my regulars, why don't you give it a watch and then subscribe? And if you are one of my regulars and you haven't subscribed yet, do it now. Also, I love my comments and my likes, thank you very much. I've got a Patreon if you want to support my content, links below. This week's case is one that I have history with. I've done a couple of documentaries on this previously and on both of those documentaries I felt really frustrated because there is only so much content that they put in, which means that you have this really limited viewpoint of what my feelings are around this case and also what I genuinely feel led to the killing of Simon Khan. The reason that this case is deeply unusual is because it involves sororicide. Sororicide is the killing of a sister within a family. What makes this even more disturbing and also unique is that it was a sister who killed her sister. We often talk about inter-family violence, but mostly that comes from males to females. And for a female to kill a female, especially a sibling, it is really unique. It's so rare. It doesn't really happen. So Saba murdering Saima makes it stand out. So where did this story begin? Well, first of all, Saima and Saba's family are Pakistani Muslim. They have been reported as being very, very orthodox. This is not true. They were not orthodox Muslims. In fact, both Saima and Saba were brought up in a family that definitely practiced their belief system, but they were not in a situation where the girls were expected to not have careers or to just be wives and mothers. You know, there was an expansive experience to their lives. And I think it's really important to put that out because there were some stereotypes that were really peddled about this family. And even when I was working on a documentary, the information I was given was very much that, that was the case. As it transpired, it wasn't the case. But ultimately, you are led by what you are told in these situations when you turn up for filming. So I just want to make sure that I put that record straight. They were born in Holland and they stayed in Holland right up until 2009. And then in 2009, they came and settled in Luton with their family. They were a multi-generational household. So Saber and Saima lived with their parents, their brothers. And also in 2011, Saima's husband, Hafiz, moved in also. So Hafiz and Saima were brought together under an arranged marriage. That was something that Saima wanted. And that happened in Pakistan. And he came from Pakistan to live with Saima's family in Luton. Now, intergenerational households are nothing new. We see it happening more and more, particularly as children are very expensive and cannot move out of their homes anymore. Actually, I'm okay with that. I'm okay if my kids never leave home. And because in the UK we have such a diverse population, we have Hindu, we have Muslim, we have Sikh, etc. It means that this is nothing new. And actually, I think the benefits of living in a household where you have grandparents and sisters and brothers available is something that's actually really positive because who wants to pay for childcare? Just putting it out there. I certainly appreciated my parents being available to me when I had kids because basically I couldn't afford to pay nursery fees. It was as simple as that. So there were lots and lots of good things and this family were very, very close. There was nothing out of the ordinary. Saima and Saba growing up didn't display anything that we would say was worrying or concerning in their relationship, quite the contrary. So Saima Khan used to describe her relationship with Saba Khan as almost feeling like she was exactly the same human being. She felt that they were two halves of the same person. They used to finish each other's sentences. They had exactly the same interests. And even though there was a difference of seven years, so Simon was seven years older than Saba, they felt completely connected. Everybody who knew them said that they were best friends. They would be together constantly when they had spare time. And so when we're looking at their history, Yes, there are some things that we can say stood out differently from Saima to Saba. Saima was more outgoing. She was quiet, but she had a bigger social circle. Saba was very much on the coattails to some degree of her sister. She idolized her. She wanted to mimic a lot of the things that she did, which even moves up to the kind of career that she took. So they both took careers as carers. And I think that whilst Simon was definitely vocational, she definitely wanted to be a carer. She liked looking after vulnerable people. I wonder, thinking about Saba per se and the way that she'd been around her sister, whether it was more about her mimicking her sister's success, wanting to follow in those footsteps. So ultimately, it can be very difficult, can't it? When you have sibling rivalry and you want to do as well as your sibling and maybe they're doing a little bit better than you, but there was nothing that stood out 
in those early years, right up until pretty much four years before Simon's death, that would have indicated there were any real problems in that relationship. Now, it feels to me like a big turning point in the relationship between Saima and Saba is when Saima gets married to Hafiz Rahman. The reason that I think this is such a turning point is, first of all, it changes the focus of Saima and Saba's relationship. Remember, Saba is younger, she idolises her elder sister, and also she's a lot more of a loner, so she's reliant on her for support and friendship. When she gets married to Hafiz, Saba is suddenly a little bit outside of the picture because now Simon's attentions are on Hafiz. And I have to say, Hafiz is a very traditional Pakistani man, as in from Pakistan, and he brings over to the UK his specific belief systems about women. And I have to take issue with those because he believes that women should be purely attending to their husband. They should be having babies and looking after the man in their life, which is, a zillion miles away from my very Caucasian Western experience. So I struggle with that because let's be honest, it's very difficult to apply a Pakistani male perspective to a Western centric model. And understandably, that would change the dynamic in Saima and Saba's household, and it does. Allegedly, and according to people who knew them, it changed the family completely. And this change in the household, you know, is pretty significant and it's recognised by both the household members and also people looking in from the outside, the community themselves. But Hafiz doesn't just change the dynamic within that household. He goes one stage further. And in my opinion, he commits something morally reprehensible. Because a few years into his marriage with Saima, and bear in mind, she's having baby after baby. She's doing what he wants. You know, she's being a good Muslim wife according to what he believes a good Muslim wife should be, and he starts sleeping with Saba. Could you be any more despicable than sleeping with your wife's sister, the aunt of your children? And Saba ultimately is quite vulnerable. She's younger, she's a loner, she's looking up to her elder sister, and to some degree, I do believe she was taken advantage of. I think that Hafiz was a very strong manipulator. I feel that he was one of those individuals who felt that he had a right and an entitlement to whatever he wanted. He was highly unfaithful from the get-go in his relationship. He would sleep with random strangers in his taxi cab, prostitutes when he went to visit Pakistan. He slept with somebody there. So he is not somebody who is moral in his behavior. And I think that Saba would probably have been captivated by the interest of her sister's partner because she held her in such high esteem that being part of that, albeit in such a dysfunctional way, made her feel that she was visible. And imagine if you've grown up feeling that your elder sister is better than you in all these different ways. And then suddenly the very person who's meant to hold her in high esteem has eyes for you. On a self-esteem and self-confidence level, we know that in the long term that would do damage. But in the short term, for Saba, it's probably ultimately important for her to feel that somebody notices her. And he takes full advantage of that. And it's easy to say, well, how on earth did Simon not realise that her sister was having an affair with her husband? Imagine having four kids, number one you are gonna be paying your attention to those constantly. Secondly, she used to be in and out of the house several times a day because Simon was the carer for a vulnerable person in their local community and she was basically on call constantly. Gave them lots of opportunity to sleep with each other when she wasn't present. Also, Saba could go meet Hafiz in his cab. So, ample opportunity. But another big thing is the bias that we carry in our lives. Most of us trust the people that we love implicitly. We trust our partners. We certainly trust our siblings. So Simon would not be looking in that direction. She wouldn't believe that her sister was the type of person to sleep with her own husband because she loved her. They were best friends. As I said earlier, Simon used to refer to Sabra and her as being two halves of the same whole. So she wasn't looking in that direction. She trusts the people that she loves. This affair goes on for four years. Four years! It's insane. This is also happening whilst Hafiz is getting his wife pregnant. So this infidelity has been ongoing. And think about that for Saba. You know, what is she going through on a daily basis? 
constantly looking at her sister with her babies with a higher level of standing in the family because she's done what she has failed to do. Because mark my words, the pressure on Saba would be huge. She's 27 at the time that she kills Saima. But 27, as a Muslim woman, she's meant to be married, she's meant to have children, and for whatever reason, she hadn't managed to attain that. So every single day in that house, she is looking at her sister and imagining that to some degree, she has the life that she wants. So she's coveting it, she's desiring it. And often, when we start to have that envy and jealousy, it can turn into something really dark. And for me, Hafiz completely crosses a boundary. Firstly, in the fact that he's having sex with his sister-in-law. But secondly, because he strings her along for a very long time, knowing, firstly, in the Muslim faith, that is deeply sinful. And it's clear that Sabah's feelings are growing. Who knows what he was telling her? Who knows what he was suggesting? What we do know is during that period of time, Sabah gets pregnant. And using her own words, she's forced into having an abortion. Now I know that you can't drag anyone kicking and screaming to have an abortion, but when we think about Saba, how much choice did she really have? She'd have had to tell her family that she was pregnant as a single woman. That would have brought incredible shame on the family. And on top of that, there is a strong possibility she'd have had to say, and by the way, it's my sister's husband's baby. That would have been catastrophic for the family. So I think that Saba probably goes through with that abortion feeling deeply resentful and angry about the fact that she's having to put herself through this pain whilst her sister gets to have babies. So now she's got a reason for this resentment to grow. She's looking at her sister and thinking, you have my life. She's looking at the man that she thinks she's in love with and feeling betrayed by him every day because he's going through the motions of being a happy partner with children and yet she knows what really goes on when her sister's out of sight. So complex, and I am not excusing Saba and her actions, but I'm saying that there is a chain of causation that leads to the actions, and it is not just Saba who is guilty here. And when it comes down to it, Hafiz loads the gun, and yes, Saba pulls the trigger, but it should not have been loaded in the first place. These are the consequences that are created by these immoral and unfair actions. Another blow to Saba during this period of time is that she does actually meet somebody. She meets a guy, it's one of Hafiz's friends, and she really likes him. And she thinks that there's a potential that they may even get to get married. She goes to her family to have a conversation about this and they basically say no. Culturally, they believe that they are too different and it's not a perfect match. So once again, even when she's presented with an opportunity to maybe fulfill her dreams and get married and have children, it's denied her. So she must have felt like everything that she wanted was just being kept out of reach whilst her sister was thriving. She carried on seeing that lover all the way through, right up until she kills her sister, but it was something that she had to do in secret. So she must have felt a level of shame over that. The fact that she had a dirty little secret, dirty little secrets even. And that must have been hugely conflicting for her. Another piece of mind-blowing information is that Hafiz actually went to see an imam to ask whether it was possible if he could marry Saba as well as Saima. It was refused. Now, there are elements of Islam where it is possible for men to marry more than one wife. Obviously, it's not legal in the UK, but it is a practice that occurs. So I would imagine as a traditional Pakistani Muslim, he was probably thinking that if he could find somebody to legitimise their relationship, that would be a way forward smacks of wanting to have your cake and eat it. I also think that Simon would probably have been horrified. Yes, she felt that her and her sister were very close, but I think this was just a little bit too close for comfort. So we have this real cooking pot, don't we, of feelings going on now. Saba is feeling resentful. She's going through grief. She's felt rejected because she's not allowed to marry the guy that she wants to marry. And she's constantly conflicted about the relationship that she has with Hafiz. Is he just using her? Is he making promises to her and then not fulfilling them? And as she starts to become more and envious and jealous, so this is a real cooking pot emotionally for Saba. Think about the resentment, the jealousy, the envy, the lack of opportunity that she feels her life is being granted. She's basically living in the shadow of her sister, even in the shadow of her sister's relationship with her partner. 
This is something that is deeply upsetting for Saba. I wonder what promises Hafiz is making to her. I wonder whether she's being told that he will leave her sister at some point. Now, I don't want to sound like I'm being over sympathetic to Saba. Obviously, we have to take into consideration the fact that she is knowingly and willingly having an affair with her brother-in-law. That would cause great pain to her sister and also to the children that Saba's helping to bring up. But there are vulnerabilities within her nature. She's previously self-harmed and tried to strangle herself. That shows you that she's vulnerable. And I think that Hafiz takes full advantage of that. And to some degree, he also opens that opportunity for Saba to become very resentful because she is looking at a life that she desperately wants, but she can't have. Think about the grief, the loss, the inability to get a match that people approve of and just going through the motions of life whilst you're looking at what you believe is your sister living it fully. It is going to breed jealousy and resentment and envy and the problem with those is they are huge triggers. In fact, when we look at crimes of passion, often they come from those kind of feelings. So Hafiz is helping to volumize and amplify these very dangerous emotions. Of course, nothing that I've said is going to excuse what Saba did to her sister. It's reprehensible, it's disgusting, it's despicable. But I do think we have to always think about the psychological motivation that occurs in the chain of causation leading to certain events. And certainly the players in this are not just Saba. So all of these feelings are bubbling beneath the surface. And I genuinely believe that what Saba was feeling was that if she could remove the obstacle that in her mind was blocking her from having a partner and having children, then she could go on to live her life fully and freely. And instead of seeing that actually that means her removing her relationship with her fees and ideally finding somebody that she could have a good relationship with, she decides that the easier option to some degree is to remove Saima. If she can get rid of Saima, then she can have the life that Saima essentially was living. And I genuinely believe that she wanted to just step in to that situation. She loved her nieces and nephews. She loved Hafiz. She enjoyed living with her parents and so on and so forth. So if she could get rid of her sister, then it's all to play for. Another big trigger that led to this murder was the fact that Saba found out that Hafiz and Saima were actually going to move out and be independent. That would have been a huge slap in the face. Remember, even though Saba knows that her brother-in-law should be off territory, she's been in a relationship for four years. She loves him, or at least thinks that she loves him. And now, all of a sudden, he's leaving her. So all those promises that he made, the hope she had that one day he'd come to her, suddenly gone. Also, she'd be looking at her sister and that resentment would be growing because now she's losing him and her. Fundamentally, even days before the murder, Saima and Saba were seen at a local shop laughing together, having fun. So she has great meaning to her still. This conflict that must have been going on within Saba must have been huge. She loves her sister, but she loathes her. She represents everything that she isn't. And I genuinely think that knowing that she was going to leave with the man that Saba loved was just too much for her to bear. And so, that's when she starts to plan the murder. And the thing about this murder is, whilst it is to some degree a crime of passion, it's also highly premeditated. So a crime of passion tends to happen in the heat of the moment. It isn't one of those things that is premeditated. It's a point where all of the feelings that you have inside just bubble over and you become rageful to the degree where you murder someone. It's not like this for Saba. Undoubtedly, she is raging inside and she certainly has a lot of very unmanageable feelings going on, but she plans, absolutely plans the detail of this murder. And that's why it doesn't fit into the general category of crime of passion. This is premeditated first degree murder. She knows that because she has a busy household, very rarely are people not in that home which means that she has to find a way of getting Saima on her own. And this window of opportunity arrives when Saba's family attend a funeral of a local person, giving her the perfect opportunity to have time with Saima on her own. So the night that the murder happens, Saima is at work and Saba is at home looking after Saima's children. This is something that happened all the time. 
Saba realizes that she needs to lure Saima home. And the way to do this is to tell her that one of her children won't settle. So she calls Saima and she uses the ruse of her child being unhappy to get her home. And she knows that she'll come because that's the thing about Saima. She's a dedicated, compassionate and loving human and mother. And so Saima, as expected, returns home. CCTV footage actually catches Saima arriving home and she enters the house and then the lights go off. And the lights go off for eight minutes. During those eight minutes, Saima is stabbed over 60 times. The brutality of the murder is intense. She's almost decapitated and she loses most of her hand. She's defending herself. Remember, she's completely unprepared for this. She's walked in off the street thinking she's going to go and sue the baby and all of a sudden she is being stabbed to death. But think about that. Over 60 knife wounds, so severe that pretty much every single vital organ was punctured. The overkill. She would have been dead after the first three or four. The coroner said that her body was punctured again and again and again after she was already dead. What does that tell you about Saba and her emotions? What does it tell you about her rage? She took every piece of her anger out on her sister in that moment. And imagine the confusion of Saima, her best friend, the woman that she trusted her children to. Saima didn't know that Saba was having an affair with her husband. Imagine what that would have been like for her, to know that your sister is murdering you and you have no understanding as to why, because as far as you're concerned, you are two halves of the same whole. She's your best friend. And I imagine as those blows were coming down on Saima, those thoughts would have been flashing in her mind. Why? How? And while she was screaming for her life, one of her children woke up and actually shouted, asking what was wrong. And Saba said it was fine, told her to go back to sleep. Just a horrific picture painted of those final moments of that loving and loyal woman. Now Saba knows that she has to make herself look like an innocent party in this situation. And the way that she does that is to create a scene. She goes to the back door, she smashes the window, and then she tips over jewelry, she takes some jewelry, she takes Simon's phone as well. She wants to make it look like it's a robbery gone wrong. She goes upstairs, she gets a shower, she puts the knife, she puts her hoodie, and she puts the phone and the belongings that she's going to make look have been stolen in a bag, then shoves that in her room. Not the best thing to do with evidence that can be used against you. Ideally, remove it from scene altogether. Don't leave it in your bedroom because there is a strong possibility that somebody is going to come and search at some point. But this tells you about Saba's state of mind. She's not thinking consequentially. She's thinking about the immediate repercussions, which is get the blood off me and I'll deal with the rest later on. And imagine what she was thinking when she took that shower, because she has literally just murdered her apparent beloved sister. She gets out of the shower. She then goes downstairs. At this point, she has a scarf with her and it seems like she gets some blood on the scarf, probably to make it look like she was trying to help her sister. But nonetheless, she's trying to create this scene. She's also cut herself when she's broken the glass in the door. And so she's bleeding from a cut. Now Sabah's committed the murder, had a shower, hidden the evidence. She's got to set the scene for other people. And that's when she picks up the phone and she rings her father. Not what you'd expect. Just going to put it out there. There might be somebody in the house with a knife stabbing somebody repeatedly, probably an unsafe person to have in the house, maybe ring the police to let them know there could be an intruder who might kill you in a minute. She doesn't do that. She rings up her father. Tells her father what's happened. He obviously is like, ring emergency services. And I'm trying to imagine what her father would have been going through. He's at a funeral, just going about his ordinary day, and all of a sudden his daughter is on the phone saying that his other daughter has been brutally murdered in their hallway. 
The consequence of that is he tells her to ring the ambulance. She rings emergency services and they turn up. And this is where it gets really, really interesting because all of this is captured on body cam, which I want you to take a look at now. <laughs> so who was at home with her, do you know? I was at home. She was just I came home. Yeah, yeah. Okay. when I came home, she went to work. I yeah. was with the kids, the girl was asleep. When I put her to sleep, I went to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. When I came back, I didn't come back out. I heard, I, have, I, have, I have kept on texting her, I was like, where are you? Because the girl was crying. I heard the girl crying. I'm mm -hmm. the girl is crying, where are you? I thought she needed milk. Mm -hmm. So I rang her and texted her, I got to her, the girl's crying. She got to me, she is here. When she came here, I shout from the bathroom, I got to her, are you home? She goes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So then I was fine. But then I heard her shouting suddenly, and when I heard her shouting, I just came out. When I came out, she it was just her shouting, you didn't hear anybody else? I didn't hear anybody okay. else. I heard banging. When I heard banging, when I came down, I saw How her How long like ago that. was that, roughly? Maybe about half an hour ago. Half an hour ago, okay. And then I came down, then I rang my dad. I didn't know what to do. Okay. First, I was literally there. I just brought Did you hear anyone I... knock on the door or anything like that? No, I don't think so. Are you aware of anyone else in the house? I don't think so, uh -huh. no. Okay. Apart from when she came in, I didn't hear anything else before okay. that. Okay. And then when she came... So, she so your, your belief is that it was just yourself, her and the children? Me, her and the children. Where were the children That's it. They're still, still inside, yeah. yeah. The, girls were, the girls were awake, so that's what I was saying, to go inside with the girls. Okay. I don't know, when I came down, I rang my dad. Firstly, I just hugged her. I just, I thought I like, when I saw the wounds, I like, I thought I'm mm. going to put pressure to her. So she, was the front door open? No, it was closed. The door was closed. The front door was closed. Was Did glass. you see anything lying down or anything? Any weapon or anything like No, that? it was just blood literally. And I walked in it. Yeah. So I literally just ran over it. I took a scarf to cover it because I thought I was going to, yeah. you know, you know when you cover the wound and like stop from bleeding and I thought what if I had... Hands? Your hands she had glass so I took the oh, glass okay. out and it was glass everywhere so I was okay. just hugging it to me and then I don't know then I rang my dad when I rang my dad and then he was like what's happened I said I don't know what happened and I rang the ambulance and then the ambulance must have rang you okay we're gonna need to get everyone in the house out okay is there a back door can we get yeah. everyone out the back have you got a key for that or would that be inside somewhere it's inside but it's glass Okay, so yeah. where's the glass? Just in here, at the front, or is it at the back as well? No, it's the back door. Oh, the, the back door smashed? Yeah. The back door, yeah. And how's that happened? Do you know? I don't know, because no, I don't know. Because when I came down, I literally saw her there with glass lying about around her. And so was and she at the front door or the back door when you found her? She was literally just at the front just there. But there's just just glass there. at the back door, so it looks like someone might have... The glass at the back door, and then we had a mirror there. That mirror was all on the floor as well. Okay broken and everything. So is the front door still shut but the glass is broken or is the front door open? No, the front, room, front door was the shut. Back door, sorry. The, front, the back door was open, I think. Okay, but I'm wide sure. open? No, we're not. Yeah, no, it was like... It was shut but the glass and it was broken. Glass was broken but the door was halfway okay. open. Do you find it strange when you watch that little bit of body cam footage? Because I found it strange straight away. First off, it's clear that that voice isn't real. That high-pitched whiny voice, it's not one that's convincing. She's acting. And I think that the officers, when they're speaking to her, also notice how matter-of-fact she is. It feels like her story has been rehearsed and she's probably had an opportunity to rehearse by telling her father. So now she's repeating that lie. And the thing about lies is they tend to be quite linear. You know, people tend to repeat the same story again and again because they are memorizing the lie itself. It's not got the chaos of a normal scenario. When we remember things that are chaotic, we often remember new things that come in and out or we forget things because we are memorizing the situation by going back and seeing it as we thought we saw it. When it's a lie, there is none of that. There's none of that collateral evidence. It's very much based on what you're making up. So she tells this story, she's desperate to get it out, but that high-pitched whining then kind of goes to a very ordinary kind of conversational tone, not what you would expect when your sister is literally dead, yards away from you, almost decapitated. You would be completely beside yourself. And I do feel that the officers find her actions quite strange because they instantly point out the fact that she's got a cut on her hand. Now she says that's from the glass that's obviously been left there. So she's immediately got a cover for this story. Also, she says the scarf that she has with her that had blood on, that was because she was trying to stem the blood that was coming from her sister. So she is trying to build a pretty convincing picture that she is an innocent bystander in a horrific murder. But her words and her behaviour in this body cam betray her, in my opinion anyway. Dead interested in your opinions, let me know what you think. But for me, 
it is just too considered and she isn't distressed in a way that we would expect her to be distressed. I have been through traumatic situations. You are not within your right mind. You're not in a situation where you can just reel off what's happened, particularly in such harrowing circumstances. The violence in this killing, as I said, was grave. 68 individual serious injuries. That in itself demonstrates what we're dealing with, isn't it? The intimacy as well of stabbing somebody is up close and personal. And I do think that there was a satisfaction that Sava got from taking out all that pent up rage out on her sister in that moment. In spite of the fact that I think that Sava's acting here is really unconvincing, the police would probably be listening to her and thinking, well, that does have some rationality to it. Whilst it's almost unheard of, to be honest, that a burglar comes in and then murders somebody in this kind of burglary gone wrong, it can happen occasionally. It's highly unusual that there would be so many injuries. Usually it would be one or two, and then the person would leave as soon as possible. So there is overkill, as I've said, in this situation, which would have caused them to consider that there was probably some other motive here. When it's overkill, we do tend to think it's a partner, an ex-partner, something to do with being a spurned lover, or there is jealousy and envy involved. So at this moment in time, they also probably think it's a man who's done it, because the violence is so huge on the body that it would seem that a man had carried it out and indeed the police do think it is a male who's perpetrated this crime. After Sab has told the police this information, the whole family are asked to go and stay somewhere else. The forensics come in, the house is cordoned off and essentially it becomes a crime scene. The neighbourhood is flabbergasted. This is a suburban environment. There is nothing like this ever happened in this area and people cannot believe it. This family is seen as a close, connected, loving household. They don't stand out in any way. They are just a good Muslim family. People loved Saima. They said she was an excellent neighbour. She was a good friend. Her work come out and give a statement about how awful this is, how they can't believe that such an amazing exemplary employee has been murdered this way. And Saba, to all intents and purposes, plays the grieving sister. And she continues that. She's comforting her fees, of course she is, we all know why. She's comforting her parents. And all the while, she knows that she's the person who's created this pain. Whilst I do believe that Saba would have been nervous after the killing, obviously she's killed her sister, I also think that she would probably think that she'd got away with murder. She's told her story, it kind of makes sense, the police seem to be convinced that maybe they're looking for a man, and initially that would give her a bolster of confidence. But her actions after the killing kind of go against her. She goes to work. Now, a lot of us recognise that you go on autopilot, when somebody dies. But this is a traumatic loss. This is a loss through murder. We would not expect a family member that close to just go back to work. It kind of goes against the instinct of being a human being. You would be devastated. You would be traumatized. You would be terrified as well. You know, what on earth has happened in this situation? And the likelihood is you'd have some leave. Certainly, if I had a member of staff whose sister had just been murdered and they turned up at work, I'd be like, go home. You definitely need to deal with this with your family. But she just carries on. That would have triggered something with the police. But nonetheless, at this moment in time, she is still a witness. And then a few days after the murder, they call her in. They want to interview her. And she sticks to the story. She sticks to this story that without a doubt, she was in the shower, she heard a bang, then she heard noise, came downstairs, found her sister dead. That's what she sticks to. But she adds a little addition. And I think that she brings this extra fact in because she recognises the level of overkill. She's thinking the police are probably going to think that the person who murdered her knew her because Simon's body was so horribly executed. And so she brings in this additional piece of information. She says, I don't know what's going on to have led to this death, but I do need to tell you that I overheard my sister was having an affair. That is so distressing, isn't it? Because Saba isn't just now responsible for the murder of her sister. She's responsible for the sullying of her sister's reputation. The fact that Hafiz would have believed that his wife was having an affair, her parents would have been ashamed of that knowledge. And also, would it have brought into play the idea that somehow Saima had been a part of her own demise? Because that's what Saba's trying to do. 
She's trying to suggest that there is this mystery person in Simon's life and that potentially that mystery person has murdered her. The police would have taken that seriously because at the end of the day, that would make sense. That would be the kind of killing that would add up that it wasn't just this random stranger breaking in and murdering Saima, it was somebody full of rage and anger that had wanted to take out all of that pent-up frustration and rage on Saima because of the way that she had made them feel. So that adds up, doesn't it? So now the police are going to be looking for this mystery person, aren't they? It's also worth noting that in the relationship between Hafiz and Saba, that Hafiz refused to wear a condom. So he was the very reason that she got pregnant. Having said that, Saba knew about the birds and the bees. She was aware why people got pregnant. So she is a willing participant in this situation. But I do believe that comes down to the vulnerability level that she had. Throughout the four year relationship that Saba has with Hafiz, she also regularly goes through her sister's mobile phone. And this in itself makes her rageful because she's seeing loving relationship messages between Hafiz and Saima. And that would make her feel second best. Ultimately, she is the mistress. She is the dirty little secret and that would give her a level of shame and resentment hard to handle. It's hard to handle for anybody but imagine living in the same household as the man that you want to be with watching him with the woman that you resent. Apparently during the four-year relationship with Saba, Hafiz does try to break it off a few times but each time Saba says that she'll hurt herself if he doesn't carry on sleeping with her. I just think he would have used that as an excuse. Oh, well, she says she's going to hurt herself if I don't have sex with her, so I better have sex with her. To me, that's just a way of appeasing his own conscience. I'm doing this to keep her alive. It doesn't really make sense, does it, logically? It takes eight days for the police to realise that they aren't dealing with some intruder or jealous ex. And that's because they start doing a more diligent search on the house. And it's at this point that forensics discover in Saba's bedroom the plastic bag with the murder weapon, with Simon's mobile phone, with the jewellery that apparently had been stolen, and also with a hoodie that had shards of glass from where she'd broken the window of the door. All of a sudden, they realised that the murderer was right under their nose, and that their expert witness is not a witness at all. Instead, that's the murderer. They also start to do searches on Saba's phone, and they find messages between her and Hafiz clearly indicating that they're in a relationship and clearly indicating that Sabra is getting more and more angry about the fact that he hasn't chosen her. They then do internet searches and here it becomes clear that this has been something that Sabra has been planning for a long time. Aside from the phone messages to Hafiz, it seems that Sabra has been plotting and planning to kill her sister in different ways. They also find messages on her phone to a fixer in Pakistan. This fixer was paid £5,000 to put a spell on Saima so that she died. Unsurprisingly, that didn't work because witch doctors aren't real. But it shows you that she was plotting and planning this for a period of time to the point where she parted with a substantial amount of money to get the job done. They then look at her browser history on the internet. They find that she searched for poisonous snakes and poisons that can kill people. So she absolutely has decided months before that she needs to get rid of her sister. That level of premeditation is huge, particularly in the fact that she'd spent £5,000. That demonstrates the commitment that she had to removing her sister completely. She also buys a knife specifically for this job. So the police are able to get CCTV footage where she's in Tesco and she's buying the knife that she consequently kills her sister with. As I said, this was not a sophisticated crime. Yes, she created quite a good story and in her mind is probably going to get away with it. But when the police start looking further afield at the potentials and possibilities who could have caused the death, they're going to come across things like phone records, they're definitely going to come across the incriminating evidence of the knife in a bag, and it seems to me that that shows again the level of immaturity emotionally so far as Sabra is concerned. There is no way she could have got away with this murder. There are too many things that she did wrong, including being seen at Tesco buying the murder weapon, perfectly on CCTV. You know, cannot miss. May as well have been wearing a sign saying, I'm Saba Khan buying a murder weapon to murder my sister. That's how profoundly obvious it is because they have got a perfect picture of her buying the knife and then they have the exact knife covered in blood in her bedroom, in a bag covered in her sister's blood. So she was always going to get found out. It always surprises me that people don't think about the digital footprint 
I mean, just imagine she's taken Simon's phone, wrapped it in a hoodie and put it in her own bedroom. That in itself is an absolutely schoolboy error, isn't it? But just the searches and the text messages, they all lead to the same place, which is guilt. And often this is something that criminals forget. They just go about their business, searching how to murder people or creating incriminating conversations with people, even arrangements that they make often lead the police directly to them, yet they carry on that kind of behavior. Time and time again, it's the digital footprint that in court, in front of a jury, means that people are brought to justice because they lead directly to that individual. It also interests me that one of the things that Saba does when she's talking to the police is paint herself as a hero. You know, she says that she's trying to stem the bleeding. So not only is she a victim of this circumstance, of this traumatic situation, she's tried her best to save her sister. Totally untrue. But again, it's trying to ingratiate herself with the police. And the fact that she's so compliant with the police at this moment in time, when she should be absolutely hysterical, again, defies reality. We wouldn't expect that. We'd expect the person to be chaotic, absolutely in pieces, and probably unlikely to be able to string a sentence together, as opposed to just be able to diligently express every single thing that you apparently had experienced in linear order perfectly without taking a breath. Doesn't make sense. When the police look at the text messages between Hafiz and Saba, it's also clear that Saba wants a relationship with him. She wants to be with him. She threatens him quite a lot. And she's constantly telling him how much she wants him, how much she adores him, how much she wants him to choose her. So her feelings are intense. And they must have been so intense for that level of rage, resentment, jealousy, envy to just bubble over in such a way that she didn't just want to kill her sister, she wanted to execute her. She wanted to take out every single moment of rage, of loss, of grief, and absolutely destroy the very thing that she felt was in her way. That in itself demonstrates the level of vitriol she had in that moment. Now the police have got all of this evidence, they've got a bang to rights. It's as simple as that. They go and they arrest her. And what she says is, she can't believe that they're arresting her. She loved her sister. There's no way she'd kill her. On one level, this is obviously a denial because she doesn't want to be caught. On the other, I think part of it is real. I think there is a part of Saba who didn't want her sister dead, who did love her, who didn't want to kill her. That she fights with this level of self-deception and self-denial. But obviously, the police are very able to build a very strong case against Saba. Now, when Saba was questioned by the lawyers who were representing her, she explained that on the night of the murder, her sister came in and a massive argument ensued and that she completely lost control. She said the relationship with Simon had become less close since 2012. She also suggested that her sister constantly humiliated her, made her feel guilty, made her feel worthless. She also said that the relationship with Hafiz wasn't actually consensual, that he was constantly raping her. And the guy that she'd wanted to marry, who she'd introduced to her parents, Hafiz had gone out of his way to disrupt and break down that relationship. So that she was the innocent victim at the hands of a horrible sister and an abusive brother-in-law. I think this is just the realms of fantasy. I really do. The messages clearly indicate that she was very much in love with Hafiz and her sister was often seen with her in a loving and compassionate way. And people noted days before the relationship that her sister was with her and they were having a great time. So arguably it doesn't stand up. But I do imagine that all that Sabra is desperate to do at this moment in time is to try to paint herself as some kind of victim in the hope that it's going to reduce the murder charge to something like manslaughter. You can understand why you do that. Manslaughter is a much lighter sentence than murder. And that is what the defence initially were going to go with. They were going to say that Saima came in, Sabra and her had a massive row, Sabra completely lost control, had no memory of doing it and basically came round in a pool of blood after murdering her sister. But it doesn't wash, does it? Because there's clear premeditation in the messages to the fixer, in the searches online, all of this points to the fact that this was premeditated, cold-blooded murder. And if it wasn't enough that the forensics had the knife, and Saba buying the knife, the phone, the jewellery that was going to go missing, and the clothes that she was wearing, covered in blood, they also found shards of glass in the clothing, which is where she'd clearly smashed the door. So, 
absolutely shows that she was banged to rights. There was no way she was going to be able to get away with this at all. It was clear that she'd murdered her sister. And you remember that scarf that she apparently used to stem the blood of her sister? Yeah, she didn't. Apparently there were a few spots of blood on it, but it's not in context with distribution of blood that you'd imagine when you were trying to stem such a horrific injury. It would be pumping out and you would be covered in it. The police also noted that when they searched the WhatsApp messages between Hafiz and Saba, that he was losing interest. He was basically making it clear that he wanted to make more of a go of it with his wife and also they were leaving, they were moving out. This would have been like a red rag to a bull. Saba has spent four years in a relationship with this man. She's in love with him. She's waited for him. She's put her life on hold for him. And now he's abandoning her for her sister and he's leaving her physically from the house. That would have been a profound message to Saba, that she was worthless, that she was secondary, that she meant nothing. And it's that feeling of being so invisible, having attained so much less than her sister, having felt that she had not achieved what she was meant to achieve, but instead of recognising that that was all within her control, she instead blames her sister. She projects all of her apparent failures in the direction of Saima. And Simon knew nothing about that. She was just living her life as a loving mother of four children with a partner that she believed loved her, spending time with a sister that she felt was her best friend. That's the truly shocking thing, isn't it? That this completely innocent victim living under the same roof as her killer and her adulterer, and yet being completely unaware. During the police interviews, Saba absolutely maintained her innocence. She lied to family, she lied to friends, she made no comment during five hours of police interviews, which instantly makes me go, guilty, you're guilty as hell, even if I hadn't found the knife and all of the things surrounding that and you on video buying the knife, I would still say you are guilty because you're going no comment. Is it just me? But no comment is instant. But obviously they have so much overwhelming evidence that there is no way she's going to get away with it. It takes 17 months before the actual case gets to court, but even though she's trying to go for manslaughter, in the end, it's clear that she has to make an obvious decision, which is to admit that she's guilty. So she pleads guilty to murder. And I think she should have, because I think if she hadn't, she'd have probably got an even sterner sentence than she did. Saba was given 22 years in prison. That is a long time. But as I said, if she hadn't have gone guilty, I think she'd probably have got more. It's chilling to imagine that sibling rivalry can be so intense, so rage provoking, jealousy inducing, envy creating, that the only way that person can deal with it is by eradicating that sibling from the face of the earth. Because that's exactly what happened in this case. This wasn't just a crime of passion. This was an execution. Saba executed her sister. And she did so with the full intent of stepping directly into her place, becoming Saima to some degree. She wanted her sister's life so much that she was willing to kill for it. And what's really sad is I don't think Hafiz would have stayed with Sabra anyway. I think she was just a convenient bit on the side. And ironically, the killing, even if she'd got away with it, wouldn't have brought her the fruition that she wanted. I hope you've found that case interesting. It's certainly one that stayed with me and I feel like I can breathe now and I've actually said what I think and I've said what I felt about this case and I've also given some accountability and responsibility to Hafiz which I never got to do in other documentaries because this is true. The chain of causation begins when people do things like Hafiz did. Took a vulnerable, lonely woman, gave her hope and then stole it from her, imagining that there would be no consequences to that behaviour. Well, there were, and there are. And now the Khan family have to live with the knowledge that one of their daughters murdered another of their daughters, whilst bringing up those four beautiful children who will never get to know 
the love, the strength, the compassion, the loyalty of the mother that was murdered. That's a generational legacy that's been stolen. And that's really, really sad. If you've enjoyed it and you haven't subscribed, please subscribe now. Otherwise, I'll see you at my next True Crime. Take care, guys.